So this talk is uh, about an algorithm to solve the super singular isogeny problem in genus two and beyond. Uh, this is joint work with Ben Smith. Um, and this is the pre-recorded uh, long version of the talk, the 25 minute version of the talk. Um, but Ben will be giving the live version um, during the conference, the five minute version. Um, so if you're watching this before the, the live stuff in late September 2020, um, then I really encourage you to tune into to Ben's um, Ben's live talk. And especially if you've got questions or comments um, or complaints about any of the stuff that I say today, then feel free to tune into Ben's talk and direct them to him. Um, he's probably better equipped to answer any questions about this stuff anyway. But if not, feel free to flick it, either of us or both of us an email and uh, we'll be happy to talk. Okay. So why are we interested in um, in looking at uh, isogeny-based crypt crypto uh, beyond elliptic curves or, or using um, uh, generalizations, high dimensional generalizations of elliptic curves? Um, well, the reason, I guess, beyond uh, doing it for fun and the, the kind of esoteric or theoretical uh, reasons to look at these to these at these questions is, at, as it currently stands, there's actually a um, a real practical potential for uh, high dimensional varieties in, in the context of isogeny based crypto. Um, so th as it currently stands, the trade offs look uh, even better than they did in um, in old school ECC or high uh, or, or HECC hyperliptic curve crypto. So I've kind of grayed out that old rationale of um, you know, Jacobians of, of genus two curves having, um, having uh, group orders that are twice the bit length of uh, elliptic curves over the same field. Or, or put another way, um, in hyperelliptic curve crypto, we, we could expect to get the same strength crypto system using primes of, of half the size. So the rationale there was, yes, you're dealing with more complicated arithmetic, but uh, perhaps using fields of half the size means that overall um, genus two uh, hyperelliptic curve crypto could still be competitive with genus one, and uh, we we saw that all the way through, even to the current standards. Um, genus two curves were were very competitive, if not uh, better, in certain scenarios than than elliptic curves because of this uh, half field size trade off. Now, in isogeny based post quantum crypto, um, the potential of of hyperelliptic and and you know genus two uh, curves or, or more generally genus G abelian varieties, um, the potential is seems to be uh, even more striking. So in the case of genus two, which is like this example that I've got on this slide, um, it uh, on the left we've got uh, elliptic curve two isogenies. On the right we've got the um, the genus two uh, analog of these, which are two two isogenies, and what we're uh, the, the, th the things we're concerned about is uh, firstly the size of the isogeny graph. So uh, in the super singular case, um, we're going to use this S sub G of P to represent the set of uh, super singular abelian varieties um, in characteristic P and uh, of genus G, in this case one. And we know that this set, uh, the set that is used in SRDH and, and the psych protocol uh, is O of P. If we move to genus two, then the size of the uh, super singular isogeny graph is a big O of P cubed. So, uh, if all things turn out to be equal and the and both settings offer hard isogeny problems um, and we can compute everything in genus two just like we would in genus one, then we might hope that we can get similar security from uh, fields that are a third the size rather than uh, half the size. So um, in this case, the trade-off looks to be looks to be even more appealing in genus two. And then, in fact, as you go up the the genus. Um, to genus three and beyond, then the trade-off just looks to get better and better and better, uh, at least as it currently stands. So um, I'll give some more examples of that later. But in, in this case, um, on the left, you've got a two isogeny in genus one. From a given node in the graph, uh, a two isogeny, um, when everything's set up in, in crypto, a two isogeny will take you to 
one of two destination nodes. In genus two, the, the analog, the 2-2 isogeny will take you to one of eight destination nodes. Again, this is if you're doing everything right in the, in the protocol sense. Um, but what that means is for every step in the, in the 2-2 isogeny graph, we're getting, I guess, three bits of entropy. Um, whereas in genus one, every two isogeny chews up one bit of entropy. So the upshot is, yep, in genus two, we might hope to, to get, uh, to be able to use fields of one third the size. And if fields of half the size were competitive in, in old school ECC, then perhaps fields of one third the size will be competitive in, in isogeny based crypto. Um, so that's why we're interested. And this whole, um, this whole talk is about looking at the difficulty of the problem um, of the analog of the of the of the elliptic curve problem in in higher genus um, varieties. Okay, before we go any further, I'm going to revisit um, the plain old SIDH uh, protocol in genus one. Um, even though this slide has no details, um, I guess I guess this could also represent the SIDH protocol in any genus. But what happens is we're dealing with super singular, uh, the super singular setting over FP squared. So we're working in uh, this expander graph. So Alice and Bob started on the same node. Um, Alice and Bob work on the same set of nodes. So their set of nodes is this, in this case, S sub one of P. Um, it's the set of super singular J invariants or super singular isomorphism classes of elliptic curves. And Though they work on the same set of nodes, their, their graphs are actually different. So Alice is working in the two isogeny graph and Bob's working in the three isogeny graph. So that means Alice's edges are different to Bob's. From any given node in the graph, Alice has three nodes that she can jump to. And Bob, ha in any from any given node in the graph, Bob has four nodes that he can jump to. And these in general will be different. Um, and won't, won't overlap or shouldn't be related, we hope, uh, to the to the edges that Alice works with. So this was, this picture was actually obtained from uh, from a real a, as a real example. So in this case, um, I'll explain the notation that's used throughout the talk in the paper. This gamma sub G L semicolon P. Uh, what that means is. What this this gamma is the graph uh, looking at super singular abelian varieties of dimension G um, over prime over the characteristic P and where L is the is typically the small prime that determines the edges of the graph. So in this case, we're dealing with genus one elliptic curves. We've fixed the prime to be uh, P equals 431 just for the sake of, of being able to fit the graph on the on a slide. Um, and Alice is working with L equals two. So her edges from any given node correspond to two isogenies of which there's three, uh, three two isogenies starting from any given uh, isomorphism class. Um, but this is what Alice's, uh, Alice's expander graph looks like for that toy example. Um, just so you get a feel for what an expander graph looks like. Uh, and if you haven't seen expanded graphs before, then roughly speaking, you, you, you can think of uh, expansion properties as being um, that at least pictorially, um, there's, there'd be no way to draw these nodes so that the picture looks any less messy. Um, and what that means uh, mathematically is that, um, or what, it, what an expander graph means mathematically is that it only takes a small number of steps to get from any node to any other node in the graph or relatively speaking, a small number of steps. So what that means, uh, another way to put that is um, we can take uh, a number of steps that's logarithmic in the graph size. And very quickly, if we take a random walk with a logarithmic number of steps, then our distribution amongst all of the nodes in the graph very quickly approaches the uniform distribution. So as long as we take a small, uh, a small number of steps logarithmic in the graph size, then we can basically end up anywhere and, and with uniform, um, with uniform probability. So, uh, switching out of Bob's graph, Bob has the same nodes, this, these Jane, these super singular Jane variants over, um, 
over f of 431 squared. And, but he's dealing with L equals three. So his edges are all different. But uh, in genus one, these edges are, uh, there's always L plus one, or in this case, four outgoing edges from any given, any given node in general. Um, and it should be the case that Alice, Alice's um, edges in the two isogeny graph are unrelated to Bob's edges in the three isogeny graph. Okay. So we're interested in, uh, in, in isogeny based cryptography. Uh, we're interested in two different flavors of super singular problems. Um, the first on the left here is the general super singular isogeny problem where we're looking to, we're given two nodes in the graph, in this case, two elliptic curves and E and E prime. And uh, in the general case, these two can be anywhere in the graph. So we're just given two uh, elliptic curves or their, or their J invariants, and we're told to go and find the path, the, the isogeny that connects them in the isogeny graph. Um, and this problem arises uh, typically in hash functions in, I guess, the popular signature schemes um, and, and a number of other protocols. And I guess it's just the general uh, mathematical, um, the, the most general super singular isogeny problem. Uh, in SIDH and in some signature schemes, we're interested in a different flavor of the problem. Um, and that is because in SIDH, uh, we're taking shorter walks. So uh, Alice and Bob are both kind of restricted to take walks that um, that are shorter than than is need that than is needed to uh, approach the uniform distribution, and these walks are of a fixed length. Um, so so Alice and Bob have a fixed public number of steps that they take in their graph, and it's not nearly enough to cover the the um, the full set of nodes in the graph. So uh, Typically, we, we, we know the number of steps that Alice and Bob took. That's, that's public information. And uh, we're told to, to try to solve this super singular problem, isogeny problem, given that we know the number of steps that they took. And, and given that the number of destination nodes is uh, significantly less than uh, the total size of the graph. In fact, in SIDH, the number of destination nodes is square root the size of the uh, square root the number of nodes in the graph so it's very the very special walks that can only land in us in a square root size subset of the of the graph so what we're going to for, i guess for the rest of the talk we're mainly going to be talking about the general problem although our um our algorithm works uh will still solve the um or still can be used to solve the the special sidh problems um but we're going to be looking at the, the, the general super singular isogeny problem. Um, and essentially, um, in, well, in genus one, the best known algorithm for, for solving this is the delft galbraith algorithm. Now, if you understand how delft galbraith works, you can basically understand our algorithm since it's um, essentially the same thing, but just uh, applied uh, differently. And what I mean by that is the delft galbraith algorithm relies on... Um, nodes in the graph being special, uh, a certain number of nodes in the graph being special in that um, if the isogeny problem, uh, if, if the domain and the codomain of the isogeny problem happen to be these special nodes, then the, uh, the best known algorithm is a lot easier than the general problem. So this is exactly what uh, the, the, the delft galbraith algorithm does. Um, on this small example, these nodes that are in red uh, are the special nodes. Um, and it's kind of a curse of having a small example is that it looks like the number of red nodes is about half or maybe even more than half of the total number of nodes. But uh, as P grows large to be like cryptographically sized, then the number of special nodes uh, is roughly square root in the elliptic curve case. So what I mean by special nodes in this case is, is subfield J invariants or subfield elliptic curve uh, isomorphism classes, and if the iso if if you're trying to compute an isogeny between say two of these subfield uh, J invariants, then you can do it a lot quicker than two of the two random um, probably extension or, or quadratic extension field J invariants in the graph. So it's a lot easier to compute 
uh, isogenies between these red subfield nodes than it is to compute the, the general problem. And what uh, Delfs and Galbraith did was to use this fact in the elliptic curve case um, to, uh, to attack the general problem. So what they do is they... Uh, so, so this is a better a better depiction of what's going on uh, in a in the in the super singular isogeny graph in in the elliptic curve case, which is there's O of P nodes, um, and most of them have their J invariant in the in the full extension field, so they're not subfield curves. But roughly square root of these nodes do have the subfield J invariant. So what Delson Galbraith did is said, okay, if we're given a general instance of the problem that we're trying to solve, we're just going to walk around close to the um, close to the input curve. So we're going to walk around close to E and walk around close to E prime until we find uh, until we find a hit um, where we where we've got one of these subfield curves. Now, even though I'm depicting this notion of um, of closeness, uh, of course, when we're given the problem, we don't have a depiction of the graph. So um, Essentially, what Delfs and Galbraith do is just take random walks starting from E and random walks starting from E prime until they uh, until both sides walk into a, a subfield node. So maybe they have to take a, a handful of, of uh, random walks on the left and a handful of random walks on the right until they until uh, they hit a subfield curve here and they hit a subfield curve here, and then they finish the problem by connecting these subfield curves. Now, um, in, in an analyzing the algorithm, all we really, uh, uh, if, this, if this, uh, this subfield problem is a lot easier, in this case, it is a lot easier in, in, um, than, than the general problem in FP squared, then the complexity of the algorithm boils down to this first step of, of how many um, how many random walks do we have to take from these curves until we're we're likely to hit one of these weaker curves? And it ends up boiling down to, to simply the proportion of the um, of the weaker curves in the whole graph. So if these things are kind of randomly and uniformly distributed in the graph, which which they they are, um, then we can expect, given that there was roughly square root p of these bad um, these bad nodes in a graph of size p, then we can expect to find them um, after we take O of uh, root p random walks from, from these input nodes. So this step of finding uh, psi and this step of finding psi prime is the hard, the hard bit, and this is done in uh, square root p, time proportional square root p. And then uh, this step of, of um, solving the subfield problem is, is in the fourth root of, of, of p. Um, so overall, we get a, uh, I don't know if it's hidden here beneath my, um, beneath my video uh, here, but we get a, a problem of, uh, a, a complexity of, of square root of P to solve the general problem. Um, this is the same complexity as Pollard Rho uh, in the elliptic curve case, but, but the delft galbraith algorithm is, is superior. It's memory free. These, these random walks can just be taken randomly. They don't need to you don't need to store anything um, deterministically or anything like that. And once you find these nodes on each side, um, which is the bottleneck, then then the rest is a lot easier. So it parallelizes a lot easier and it, and it uh, oh yeah, I should say, since we're, we're talking about post-quantum crypto, it, it, um, it can, you can wave the quantum wand over the algorithm um, much more easily than you would other algorithms. So in this case, applying Grover's algorithm um, to, the, to the search problem of finding these subfield nodes from each of the input nodes, uh, Grover's algorithm applies directly, and it's um, it gives you the square root speed up. So th things go from square root of uh, big O of square root of p to big O of uh, the fourth root of p um, when you when you do uh, the quantum version. I should say the quantum version of Delft Galbraith is due to Biasi, Zhao, and Sankar, um, and they also showed how to get a, a speed up on the on the easy step, um, but you you don't have to use that. Uh, that speed up. Okay, so del scale breath, big O of square root p uh, in classical sense, big O of fourth root of p in the quantum sense. And as I said, if you un understand del scale breath, then you then you'll understand uh, essentially what what we're doing. 
Okay, so let me go back to what I uh, what I spoke about um, earlier, and that is uh, the app the the, the, app, the appealing um, why we're kind of interested in these um, high dimensional abelian varieties in isogeny based crypto. So we saw the example that in in genus two we get graph sizes that are big O of uh, p cubed, whereas in Old school ECC, we got graph sizes that were p squared. Oh, sorry, not graph sizes, but group sizes rather, discrete log group sizes that are that are p squared. This um, we get graph sizes in in arbitrary genus given by this um, this formula. Uh, so in genus three, we get a graph size that's big O of p to the sixth. So if we were to work, if we were to solve everything in genus three and convince ourselves that the problems were hard and that we could do all the arithmetic, then we could expect to perhaps use fields that were um, uh, one sixth the bit length of the fields that we might use in genus one. Um, whereas in old school ECC, it would only have been one third. Um, and then th this this exponent of P grows quadratically here. So the I guess the um, the appeal just keeps growing as, as you increase the dimension. So on one hand, it's, um, it's seemingly more potential for high dimensions, but on the other, we at the moment we kind of know very little about the um, about the isogeny graphs beyond the the genus one case, um, and of course this is to say nothing about how we would actually implement these things in practice. Um, but nevertheless, nevertheless, um, I guess in this paper uh, we make the hypothesis that the the graph of um, that that gamma sub g uh, for L and P is um, Ramanujan. And what that means is it has all the nice um, expansion, rapid mixing properties um, that we have in genus one. So we're making the same uh, implicit assumption um, that I guess prior works in the, in the um, high dimensional isogeny based uh, crypto line of works have, uh, have assumed. Um, we're making the same hypothesis, but it's it turns out that this is not technically true. Um, although there's good reason to believe that um, that it is that it's uh, close to true, or that we do get good expansion properties that are, I guess might be good enough to do to do crypto isogeny based crypto. So um, we make that assumption and and we carry on. Uh, but I you can check out the paper for for more com comments on that. Okay, so. In uh, in genus two, um, the a recent paper by Castric, De Crew and Smith um, looked at the, doing the genus two a, a genus two hash function, um, and they kind of looked at a couple of uh, problems that appeared in the earlier um, the earlier genus two line of works, and uh, one thing that I'll sweep under the rug and skip over is that we don't we're not talking about the super singular um, the set of super singular varieties we're talking about super special when we go beyond genus one and um, I'll just say for genus one it, it coincides with the definition but for genus two and above um, Castric de Crew and Smith said that super special is the correct notion uh, when we're dealing with these graphs now another thing that that they pointed out in their work is that um, originally uh, or at least um, theoretically, in in the two two isogeny graph uh, for genus two, there's 15 is outgoing two two isogenies from any given node in the graph. Um, but it turns out that only eight of these are good. Now, what they mean by good is that they avoid um, the the potential pitfall of running into cycles where you're just cycling back to the same node in the graph. So, if you really want to expand in the the two two isogeny graph. Um, they they show that these um, that there's actually eight nodes that you want to be able to to jump to, and they give ways to constructively um, avoid the bad cases. Um, I guess the seven the seven bad cases that 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 may run into trouble and, and into cycles. But um, one thing that was interesting in that in that paper is that they they showed how to avoid these these special cases. But it did bring up the notion of of there being special cases in the in the um, in genus two graphs and, and in the high dimensional graphs. So what do we mean by special cases? Well, there's a theorem that says that uh, super singular uh, abelian varieties 
of dimension G are actually isogenous to a product of G super singular elliptic curves. Um, and so in the, in the genus two case, what that means is that every super singular um, isomorphism class represented in this, in this graph um, is, 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 isom is isogenous rather to, um, to a, an elliptic product. Now, essentially the crux of uh, this paper, this work is viewing these elliptic curve products as, as special, um, as special nodes in the graph that are weak compared to general nodes in the graph, just like Delfs and Galbraith use the subfield nodes um, to attack the, the genus one problem. We're going to use these product nodes to attack um, the arbitrary, the arbitrary genus G problem. So uh, in the CDS, in, uh, in the CDS paper, they show that uh, they show how to avoid these elliptic curve products um, constructively. But in this work, when we're cryptanalyzing the problem, we're going to, to try to use the Del Galbraith methodology to, to, um, to try to find these elliptic curve products when we go to attack the problem. So um, th th this, is, this is indeed the crux of the paper. So to find an isogeny from A to A prime, when A and A prime are both in this, um, this genus two super special uh, isogeny graph, we're going to assume that that they're that they're good instances, so that um, the isogeny problem, you know, that the inputs to the problem are, are randomly distributed in this graph. And it turns out that um, again, the good instances are overwhelmingly likely if you're just randomly sampling from the graph, um, just like they were in in genus one. But uh, the the bad instances of these um, elliptic curve product nodes are common enough that we can still hope to walk to them um, from any given node in the graph. So we're going to do essentially what we're going to mimic Delft's, Delft's Galbraith and we're going to look for a path from A to an elliptic curve product. We're going to look for a path from A tilde um, to, uh, sorry, we're going to look for a path for, from A, which is a, a one of these, um, one of these good, good, uh, one of these good genus two varieties in the in the graph to to a weak instance, um, and then we're going to look for a, another path from a prime to a to one of these elliptic curve products, and then we're going to actually connect the the path from a to a prime, going from a tilde to a tilde prime, uh, which are these these elliptic curve products. Now to to connect the the paths from a tilde to a tilde prime, we actually just use the Delft Galbraith algorithm and, and compose. Um, and solve the isogeny problem in the elliptic curve uh, sense, and then we can um, compose all of these paths to get a path from the original A to A prime. Okay, so this is how we, we work. I've basically taken exactly the same picture um, in genus two. Um, I've taken the same picture as the Delft Galbraith thing, and I'm going to say that we, here we've got. Uh, roughly p cubed nodes in the genus two super singular isogeny uh, a graph. So almost all of them, let's say, are uh, isomorphic to Jacobians of, of um, genus two curves. And these red dots, we're going to assume are these, um, these elliptic curve products. And all we do, just like Delson Galbraith, is we randomly walk from the two inputs to try find a path to these weak product curves, and then we connect the product curves using Delft Galbraith in, in genus one, and then we compose all of these paths to give a path from A to A prime. So just like it was before, uh, the complexity here is dominated by the complexity of finding, um, the complexity of finding the walks from the two input nodes to these weaker nodes. Um, and again, this just boils down to how common um, these elliptic curve products are in the, um, these bad nodes are in the, the grand scheme or, or amongst all of the, all of the super special nodes 
in genus two. And in this case, uh, there's roughly um, one in one in p of these nodes will be um, will be weak. So it takes us about o of p random walks from from our input nodes to find uh, these product nodes, and then we can connect them using the the much faster Delft Galbraith algorithm. So in the case of genus two, the algorithm the the the, um, the algorithm is simple. It's it's just walking around until we find a, a two product of a product of elliptic curves, and then then connecting them um, using Delft Galbraith. Now to go beyond genus two to um, to genus G, uh, we do a very similar thing. And, and now I should I should I guess since um, since Ben is the invited speaker of the conference, I should actually uh, I, I might share an anecdote to kind of show to what what it's like to work with Ben. Um, so the way that this paper came about um, was that Ben and I were looking to do things I guess constructively in genus two. Um, following his paper with uh, De Croo and Kastrick. Um, and we were writing notes to each other back and forth during a talk in Nijmegen. And uh, when we were trying to figure out how to do uh, some constructive stuff, we um, we thought, oh, okay, maybe we, we have to really worry about these um, elliptic curve products in the cryptanalytic sense. Um, so maybe we can use... Uh, Although we can skip over them constructively, maybe the the attacker can um, can use the the product the the product of two elliptic curves to to attack the genus two problem. And I think basically at the end of this talk that we were chatting in, um, that's all we we'd said. Or maybe the genus two problem um, is easier if we you know maybe there is a problem with with looking for these elliptic curve products that we have to think about. Um, and I think that's basically all we'd we'd agreed on and then uh, Ben had to leave. So straight after the talk, we thought, oh, there might be something to this elliptic curve product thing. There might be an attack that's better than, than what we think. We, we weren't sure then. Uh, and then Ben had to leave and get on the train and go back to Paris. Um, and then by the time Ben got back to Paris, which was only a few hours later, he'd already committed a version um, of the general algorithm in genus G to the rep a repository and es essentially the version that he committed that he figured out on the train um, is essentially the same unchanged in the in the paper as it stands and he'd already nutted out all the complexities um, of all the steps in the algorithm and essentially written what is the crux of the paper so um, <laughs> my contributions to the to this algorithm one basically stopped in the genus two case and then Ben figured out a way to to generalize the genus G in the space of a train trip okay so what did what did what is algorithm one in, in genus g so it's essentially the same idea but just recursing down the dimension um and so if we're given the isogeny problem between two um principally principally polarized abelian varieties of dimension g then what we're looking for in the first step of the algorithm is we're going to randomly walk from these varieties assuming that we can randomly walk and everything's and everything's fine in dimension G um, until we run into a product of an elliptic curve and a dimension G minus one variety um, and the same on the on the domain curve or the codomain curve uh, the codomain variety rather um, and then we're going to instead of solving this uh, 5G problem we're going to, we're going to connect the path between E1 and E1 tilde and look at the problem that arises between the G minus one dimensional varieties here. So then Ben figured out, okay, we can just keep recursing down the dimension until, so we can we can solve the dimension G minus one problem by, by again walking around till we find an, a product of an elliptic curve with a G minus two dimensional variety and so on and so forth until we hit genus two and then we just run the genus two version of the algorithm to get a product of elliptic curves now at the end of the day essentially what this does is uh, a bunch of random walks and running into products presents us with a bunch of um a bunch of problems to solve between elliptic curves um over the same field so we get g elliptic curve problems 
to solve, and then we can just call the good old Delft Galbraith algorithm in in uh, in genus one. We can compose all of these um, all of these uh, subpaths to to go back and and uh, have the have the full path between the two g-dimensional varieties. So once we do this and we look at the um, the complexity of this algorithm, we find that uh, again the first step, the first random walk from the two input nodes, um, dominates the complexity. So all we all, so the, the the step that that looks for that walks around in the in the uh, g-dimensional graph for this first product of an elliptic curve and a g minus one dimensional uh, variety, that is what dominates the complexity. So again, just like all of the, the previous examples, what we're, what we're looking for is what proportion of nodes in the, uh, the g dimensional um, graph actually are these bad worrisome nodes. And it turns out that the proportion of these nodes that are bad is uh, big O of p to the g minus one. Uh, where g is the genus and so because this step dominates the complexity and all of the steps underneath are, are much less then algorithm one runs in uh, o tilde of p to the g minus one uh, isogeny operations um, and in uh, and just like Delft Galbraith because these walks are random and we don't have to store anything when we're trying to find these weak nodes in the in the graph then this algorithm parallelizes perfectly across P processes and it also, um, we can wave the quantum wand over the algorithm just like we did, um, or just like the us, uh, Zhao and, uh, and Sarkar did in, in, genus, in genus one for the, for the Delft Galbraith algorithm. So we get the square root speed up that Grover, um, that the Grover search allows us to do on a quantum, on a quantum computer. Okay, to summarize, um, to summarize, we've got, uh, we're comparing um, this this algorithm, this recursive algorithm in in genus G or dimension G, um, to the classical uh, Delft Galbraith or um, I guess kind of row square root style algorithms, and we're comparing the quantum version of our algorithm to to the analog of the Biasi Jao Sankar um, algorithm. So this table just gives the base p logarithms of of the run times um, without the big O of of solving um, solving these problems in in genus G. So as as the genus goes up, um, if we were to just uh, do the kind of square root algorithms in the full isogeny graph, then Delfs and Galbraith uh, grows like this. But our algorithm, um, which is O tilde of of p to the g minus one um, performs a lot better than the than the um, Del Scal Galbraith beyond genus one and and um, looking for these product these uh, product varieties um, turns out to be better in the quantum sense as well um, with our square root speed up. So for solving the general problem uh, beyond genus one, this uh, this recursive algorithm is uh, of looking for these product varieties does a lot better. Um, than than the genus uh, that's sorry than the than what we would have otherwise thought to do um, but this as I said at the start I haven't talked about um, the problem uh, the the specific this is this is all to do with the general isogeny problem I haven't spoken about the specific kind of SIDH style problems that are that arise when you do much shorter work uh, walks in the graph um, and so it might look like this is a this is a killer um, as far as the general isogeny problem goes in in higher genus, and maybe it is a bit of a buzzkill for the general isogeny problem in higher genus. But I still think for sh for these shorter walks, for these SIDH style walks, um, that our algorithm might might not be better than what we would have otherwise thought to do, um, especially for genuses less than uh, less than six. So. Genus two and three and things, um, it might still be uh, really favourable to do Diffie-Hellman, um, you know, SIDH style protocols. Um, this this shouldn't be seen as a deal breaker in that in that regard. Okay, to summarise, um, so the general isogeny problem in dimension G 
is now uh, O tilde of P to the G minus one on a classical computer and uh, square root of that on a quantum on a quantum computer. Um, and as I said, I, I, although this might be a buzzkill for, you know, hash functions in, in higher genus and, and the general problem in higher genus, um, the paper discusses that, that the trade-offs for these shorter walks and for the Diffie-Hellman-like applications uh, in lower dimensions, uh, you know, our algorithm might, might not be best for attacking those things. So um, there's still a lot, of, a lot of work to be done before we can either uh, be confident that, that, you know, genus two, three, and these small genuses are, are either really good to do or really attractive to do isogeny-based crypto or before we can be convinced that they're not a good idea. Um, so there's a lot of research still warranted in, in both directions. And I'll stop there.